starting to get a little bit chillier outside when uh, this morning my wife and kids came to drop me off. It's 34 degrees, and uh, my son, who's wearing a jacket and a beanie, gets to the threshold of the apartment uh, where uh, inside, outside, and he gets to the door, and we're trying to get to the car so I can get here on time, and, and he says, no, too cold. <laughs> he's two and a half years old. Uh, at least he's honest. Um, I'm from Southern California. He was born in Boston, uh, which means he has less of an excuse, but hate to tell him it's only going to get worse, <laughs> right? Fear is a powerful thing. Got a personal story to start off this morning. The year was 1998, and there was a trailer for a horror film going around, and it happened to be on some of the channels that I watched some of my programming on, and that, that movie was Bride of Chucky. Now, you've probably never heard anyone reference that movie in a sermon before, so I'm happy to be that for you this morning. Uh, no need for details. There was a red-haired, angry-looking doll that went around doing the things that bad people do in horror films. We'll just leave it at that. Anyway, someone whom I love dearly, who was much, much older than me, much, much older than me, uh, who didn't really watch much television, uh, was very fond of getting my sister and I surprise gifts. And one time at a garage sale, this particular person, who will remain unnamed, but you know who you are and you're probably going to end up watching this from California, this person at a garage sale mistaking my fondness of Mortal Kombat figurines, for those of you who remember Mortal Kombat, Uh, saw this orange-haired, angry-looking doll at a garage sale and thought, ooh, it's a boyish doll. Maybe we'll go with this. So by a series of unfortunate events, this doll ended up in my room without my knowledge while I was gone. And by another series of unfortunate events, a blanket ended up on top of this doll. And that evening, when I went to bed and woke up because it was cold, because in Southern California it gets cold, I went and I pulled the blanket, and there in my room was the doll. Fear is a powerful thing. Some of you have moments that you can recall in which you were deeply afraid and those moments are entrenched into our brain, are they not? For me, it was a Chucky doll. I never actually saw any of the films. Um, Probably a good thing. Anyway, fear is a powerful thing. Sometimes fear is justified. Sometimes it's not. Uh, In our country... 1.8 1.8 million Americans suffer from agoraphobia. 3 to 5% of Americans are afraid of heights. 10%, uh, over 10% of Americans avoid the dentists out of fear. Uh, the professionals call these extreme or irrational fears phobias. Right? 40% of all phobias have to do with bugs or spiders. Some of you can relate to that, right? I remember like, seeing a daddy long leg on the inside of the house and and I mean, I freak out. My wife says, no, it's a good one. And I'm like, I don't care if it's a good one. Get me, and you get the biggest book you can find, right? And, and then you throw it because I don't want to go near it. But fear is a powerful thing. Oftentimes, fear in our world is used to manipulate. In 2016, 44% of the people who voted for Hillary Clinton didn't actually support Hillary Clinton. They were voting against George Bush, or ugh, Bush, Trump in part because they were afraid of what Trump would do. 53% of the people who voted for Trump didn't actually support Trump. They were voting against Clinton because, in part, they were afraid of what Clinton would do. In the previous few weeks and months, politicians from both sides have been ramping up fear tactics because if you can get people afraid, you can get them to do what you want. Fear is a powerful thing. What does a Christian do with fear? What does fear mean to us? In Scripture, we encounter countless occasions in which God and His prophets say, Do not fear. But do such words ring hollow? Do we often think of them as just a church cliche? What do those words mean for the teenager petrified of a class because of the mockery and ridicule certain classmates that hour will bring? What does it mean for the person put on their knees by a gunman? What does it mean for the one hooked up to a ventilator knowing they have days to live? Are they a church cliche that we often hear but perhaps rarely ponder? 
Or could it be that such words uttered by God himself carry within them and are undergirded by a truth that perhaps offers a strength, comfort, power, and endurance greater than anything this world can bring? Today, that's what I want to talk with you about. First, I'm going to pray. Lord, we give you this time. May your words ring clear. May it be about you, not us pierce our hearts with what we need, and may the rest fall away. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in Isaiah 51. Last week and in a couple weeks, we're gonna, we heard sermon, uh, servant songs, Jesus songs in Isaiah, songs that point to the servant who is Jesus. In Isaiah 51, you get a break from 50 and 52 in which you encounter those servant songs in which God addresses the faithful remnant of Israel. Remember, these are the people who had been exiled to Babylon, who God would bring back, people who had suffered a lot, who had seen a lot of suffering, who had been surrounded by danger, who knew what that was. And he addresses them in chapter 51. And this morning, we're going to zero in on two verses. There's a lot of themes and a lot of thoughts throughout Isaiah 51. Much of it overlaps with what we've already preached. But these two verses are going to highlight a theme we've encountered but have yet to really dive deeply into. And that's what we will do this morning. And I'll read them to you now. Verse 12. I, God speaking, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, of the son of man who is made like grass and have forgotten the Lord your maker? who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor when he sets himself to destroy. Where is the wrath of the oppressor? Here's my plan for the morning. Three things. One, I want to define fear of man. The text is talking about a fear of man, not a fear of nature, though that's addressed elsewhere, a fear of man. What is fear of man? What does it mean to talk about the fear of man? Next, the text gives us three insights into why We would fear man, causes for us to fear others. And when I say man, I'm using that inclusively. I know that's not politically correct, but it's what we encounter often in the literature. Fear of people, fear of man. And last, what is our response? So first I offer a definition. This is not going to be found in an appendix in the scripture. This is me scouring the scriptures, looking for instances in which people fear others and God responds. And so I present this to you this morning, that to fear man is to surrender our hope to the promises, purposes, and proclamations of man. To surrender one's hope to the promises, purposes, and proclamations of man. Our hope, our confidence, our trust. John Piper writes that our biblical hope is not only desires something good for the future, expects it to happen, but is confident that it will happen. In other words, hope has to do with the future, that trust, that confidence. And a fear of man places that confidence in the people around us. It places that confidence in the job that we have and the people we work with. It places that confidence in the social media following. It places that confidence in the person in front of us who may very well bring us physical harm. That is the fear of man. And we encounter this all throughout Scripture by people who are important players in Scripture. This isn't isolated to us. In Genesis 20, Abraham is going down to Negev with his wife, Sarah. And when he gets there, his wife is beautiful, and he's afraid of what's going to happen to him. So he tells him, it's my sister. Just a few chapters earlier, God had told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the world through you. You're going to have kids, and you, through, through you, you're, you're, you're going to have so many descendants, and through you, the world will be blessed. He hasn't had Isaac yet, and yet how quickly did he forget his confidence in God? How quickly did he lean away from the promises of God and instead feared man? You go forward a few hundred years and you get to Numbers 13. God has brought the Israelites out of Egypt, out of bondage and slavery, and so they get to the border with Canaan, and they send in 12 spies to search out the land. And they all come back, two of them, Caleb and Joshua, said, it's good, God's got us, let's do it. And the other 10 say, our enemies are too great. God's already promised the land, but what happened? The people were afraid. They said, we'd rather go back to Egypt than follow you there. They'd rather choose slavery than the promises of God. That's the fear of man. Last. In Matthew 26, Peter, with Jesus, 
dares, says to him boldly, as Peter often does, I would die first before I deny you. The next day, what happens? Jesus is taken. He's brutalized. He's beaten. Cast aside. And Peter, addressed by three people in the crowd, goes on to deny Christ three times. Luke 22 actually says that after the third denial, Jesus looked at Peter. Could you imagine the moment? How surreal. That's the fear of man. It cripples our hope. It blinds us to God's promises. It overshadows his purposes and it drowns out the comfort and solace of his proclamations. It is perhaps one of the dangerous traps we can fall into as people because it effectively erases God from the equation. So the question becomes why? Why do we have this problem? Why did Abraham have this problem? Why did the people of Israel, why did Peter, who followed Jesus for three years, who saw him heal people, who saw him restore the lame, who heard him forgive and do things that only God could do, and still yet in that moment surrendered his confidence in his Jesus to the people who pressured and surrounded him? Why? Well, in this text, I believe we get a few reasons. Verse 12, it says, I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? What a question. Think about that. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies? We see that question elsewhere in Scripture. In James 4, it says, There is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you to judge your neighbor? In Romans 9, But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Who are you to talk back to God? Who are you to judge? Who are you to talk back? And then who are you to be afraid? What? Such a question assumes something. Such a question responds to something. Such a question subverts something about us. And that thing is that the fear of man is caused by human pride. Now, if you're like me, you may recoil at such a thing instinctually. When I think of sixth grade, nerdy, socially awkward Zach, right, who absolutely hated middle school, like many of you here. In fact, if if you enjoyed middle school, we hate you. (laughs) Because you're the reason we didn't enjoy middle school, right? But when I think of that Zach, the last thing I think is pride. When I think of someone cowering in fear, trembling, the last thing I think of is pride. It just doesn't seem all that obvious, and yet I would challenge you to consider with me the text a bit more deeply. That when the enemies circle us, and as we see in Scripture, there are times throughout the Old Testament in which the enemies literally encircle people, and he says, do not fear. That when the enemies circle us, and that when people threaten us harm, for some of you, that may very well be physical harm. But for most of us, that will not be the case. Maybe it is emotional, relational, psychological. But when some sort of harm or no good is threatened upon you, that when we encounter these moments, we default to a place in our mind in which we revert to what can I say, what can I think, what can I do to get myself out of this? Because if I can't, no one will, and I'm done. I'm ruined. I'm destroyed. It's all done. That if I can't rescue myself, no one will. I fear because in that moment, I think the only person I can trust is myself. And if all I can trust is myself, that means I can't trust God. That's pride. God says, who are you that you fear man? Human pride erases God from the equation. And it's one of the ingredients to our fear of man. Isaiah doesn't stop there. The text goes on. He says, Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies of the son of man who is made like grass? All right, some parallelism here, talking through that people are are like grass. Well, what in the world does does that mean? Well, what he's saying here is, uh, I'll just give you the point and I'll explain it. The fear of man is caused by a narrow perspective. And I'll explain that in a second. The use of grass talks about things that are temporary. You see, in in this particular geographic location, wet and dry season, when the rains came, the grass sprouted, but quickly the heat of the scorching sun would destroy the grass. Grass was symbolic of temporariness. In James 1, it says that the rich are like grass. Interesting. 
considering how much of our energy goes towards building wealth. In 2 Kings 19, it says that our enemies are like grass. What is God saying here? That the obstacles you face, that the people you encounter, that the ones who want to do you harm, that the crisis you face, that it is temporary and it won't last. God confronts the people with the temporary nature of their world. And perspective becomes really, really important. Perspective affects our hope. Perspective affects our confidence. Perspective affects our trust. Perspective matters. We've got a few pictures here. Go ahead and put on the first one. Some of you know who this is. Some of you don't. And that makes the people who do feel old. This is John F. Kennedy Jr. Go ahead and zoom out. Zoomed in, you see a three-year-old child on his birthday dressed up and saluting. Zoomed out, you see a child saluting his father who was just killed at a funeral. Perspective matters. Pretty iconic photo. Go to the next one, another iconic photo. What a beautiful landscape. Some of you may be familiar with this one. All right? Man, some of you would like to be there right now, wouldn't you? Zoom out. What about now? Perspective's important. Perspective matters. Well, Zach, in these two situations, perspective has made me feel more sad and more afraid. Okay? That's not what I'm going for. Um, what if perspective could make you more confident? What if perspective could give you hope? What if despite the situation you find yourself in, you feel like there's no way out, you feel like you're done, you feel like you've lost, you feel like victory is out of sight, and you just feel like it should end now? What if perspective could give you hope? Go and put the next one up. Now, there are people in this room who don't know what this is, and the rest of us are judging you. This is Super Bowl, New England versus Atlanta. That at two minutes and eight seconds left in the third quarter, New England was down by 25. Historically, this is a terrible spot to be in for a team. Uh, I don't care if you're a fan of greatness or not. Let's just pretend, like, that was my dig. Did you catch that? Um, <laughs> forget the team names. Pretend you're on the team with three points. How do you feel in this moment? How do you feel? Where's your confidence and your hope at? Squat. You don't know that at the end of this game that it's going to read 34 to 28. But what if at a huddle some guy comes and he has a screen and he shows you and you get to watch the last 15 seconds of the game and it includes you running off the field victoriously with a smile on your face and your hand pumping in the air because you've won. That's a change of perspective, isn't it? It's what we get with Scripture. It's what we get with our Jesus. It's what we get with our God. We get a broadened perspective and when we forget God, we fear man because of a narrow perspective. Perspective matters. Perspective affects the way we treat people. We need to remember that our enemies are temporary, our crisis are temporary. Even our reputations are pretty temporary, aren't they? What people think of us drives us, does it not? I think about high school. If you're in high school, if you're a teenager now, let me offer up some wisdom to you. When you graduate high school and you walk up there and they give you a diploma, it won't be your actual diploma, it'll be a piece of paper rolled up. But when they figuratively give you your diploma... You give them something back. In that moment, you hand over your reputation because it no longer matters. The thing you spent hundreds or thousands of hours constructing and worrying about over the course of your high school career no longer matters when you're an adult. It doesn't. Some of us in this room think back to 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old you and you think about the stupid things that you did because you wanted people to like you or because of some trend. Yes, I'm talking to all the men who had mullets. <laughs> Some of you rock those photos proudly, and I love it. I do. I do. All right? But if you could go back and talk to 15-year-old you, you'd probably have some, what, perspective to give. How many people in those worlds driven by fear, when we forget God, we fear man? Do we not? That brings us to our last point, which is this, verse 13. 
It says, and you have forgotten the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. The fear of man is caused by a forgotten God. I've already said this a few times, but we've got to drill this home. The G is intentionally lowercase. Why? Because when we forget God, that's what we do. Do we not? It says here, and you have forgotten the Lord your maker and stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. Your maker who created you and who created the world around us. These are two really important points. And I would just say that these are two principles that Western society in large part is actually built upon. That God made you. That our founders of this country said that you were endowed with inalienable rights. Why? Because you were made by a God who many of us have forgotten. Our notion of human rights, of human dignity, comes from Scripture that you were made in God's image. And yet we forget what happens when you, when you build a society on principles and pull out those principles? What about the other part where it says that God created the heavens and the earth? Edward Davis wrote an article. He's a professor of history of science talking about how important the principles of Christianity were for the scientific revolution. The uniformity of nature and induction, those are nerdy terms. You can forget them. If you're a scientist, you may be familiar that you had to have Christian principles for the scientific revolution. And there's a reason why he points out that the majority of the people who started the scientific revolution were actually Christian. You had principles that we built on. What happens when you pull out the principles? What are you left with? Well, according to people like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, famous atheists, they would say you're left with reason. And that's what we should have. We should run our world based on reason. Well, it turns out that all the evidence says that while man has reason, we are not very rational creatures. In fact, we are quite irrational. The medical community, the sociological community, and the economic community constantly put out research that shows that we do not behave rationally. It's pretty interesting. You would have more energy, be less groggy, and enjoy your day more if you stopped eating processed sugar and drinking coffee. Is that going to happen? people would experience far less unnecessary pain and suffering if they ate better and exercised more and some would say i don't have energy or time for that or well if you did it you would have more energy it should give you more time we don't do it because we don't want to study from princeton a few years back found that an income after seventy-five thousand dollars per year that happiness levels off in fact people often have Interesting new struggles associated with getting more money. Money cannot buy you happiness, and yet people are willing to sacrifice so much to get more and more. A 75-year study done at Harvard that is still going, 700 men, all right, tracing out their lives, and now their kids' and their grandkids' lives, found that the single greatest cause of happiness in a person's life is their relationships. The study also found that right now, if you were in your 50s, the single greatest indicator of how healthy you will be in your 80s is not your cholesterol and it's not your blood pressure it's how meaningful and healthy your relationships are with your friends and your spouse and yet many of us in our quest for more stuff more things are willing to sacrifice the people who truly matter it's why so many people because we're irrational go to starbucks every morning and don't put any money in their ira I'm talking to my generation on that one right avocado toast what so let me know what I'm talking about. Man may have reason, but man is not very rational. And study after study goes to show that. Look at the lottery, for instance. Oh, my goodness. But when you forget God, what are you left with? You're not left with people behaving rationally. You're left with people doing what they want because that's what we do. My son, a week ago, uh, a few days ago, he was throwing a fit. He's two and a half. All right, that's what two and a half year olds do. They throw lots of fits. All right, it can be worrisome. But in this particular fit, we're trying to talk him through, and at one particular, he just smacked my wife in the face. All right, many of you have been there. And so we're trying to process the moment with him, and I ask him once he's calmed down, why did you do that? He's not smart or sophisticated enough to come up with a, with a, a lie of an answer. So he told the absolute truth. He said, because I wanted to. He's being honest. We look at the world around us. What are people doing? They're doing what they want. And when you forget God, 
one of the most terrifying things about people is that people just do what they want. And what you're left with is two particular sides getting louder and louder and louder, arguing more and more and more, getting more angry and frustrated and angry and irate and wrathful. And that's all they have because we live in a world in which it's about what people want. Not that any of us would be familiar with that at all in our own culture, right? When you forget God, you fear man. And the world we live in can be pretty darn terrifying when we do indeed forget God. So don't forget him. We remember him. We trust him. We put our faith in him. And the question becomes, where do we go from here? I said earlier that fear is to surrender our hope to the, to the promises, purposes, and proclamations of God. Well, what if, instead of surrendering those things to man, what if we surrendered those things to God? What are the promises, purposes, and proclamations of God? And what do they have to do with us? Well, in Romans 8, God says this. This is a promise for you. This is a promise to you. That in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, rulers, angels, things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation, pretty much checks off everything that we deal with. That none of those things will be able to separate us from the love of of God and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing in this world, no threat you ever encounter, no threat you ever experience could ever rip away the greatest treasure you have. And that treasure is not the 80, 90, 100 years you want to live on this earth. That treasure is not the retirement years that you're looking forward to. That treasure is not the house or the car or whatever trend you're buying into. It's not even your family. That treasure is Christ. Period. End of story. And there is nothing that can be done to separate that treasure from you. That's God's promise to you. We cling to that. We claim that. What's God's purpose? Jesus says to his followers that the whole law can be summed up in this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Before he departs, he tells his disciples to go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We get so flustered in our world today because we confuse our purpose. Your purpose is not that long life, though that's very convenient and I'm not going to complain if I live a lot of years. My purpose is not to get a position of power or influence. My purpose is not to raise a ton of kids or grandkids, though that would be great. What happens is that when the world sells you a purpose and you embrace, you cling to, you claim that purpose as your own. When things threaten it, it makes you afraid because you've embraced the wrong purpose. We are here to love our Lord, to love our neighbor, to glorify God, to enjoy him, to make disciples, to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's your purpose? The history of our church is littered with martyrs, people whose dedication to the purposes of God were informed by perspective and whose lives ended because of it. One such martyr was Polycarp. Polycarp died in the mid-150s AD. He was one of the earliest leaders of the early church. Many say that he knew the apostle John. Polycarp was unwilling to burn incense to the emperor And so he was taken to be killed, and he knew it was coming. And so, put where he was going to be burned at the stake, he was quoted as saying this, Eighty and six years I have served him, referring to Jesus, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season. Season. Temporary. Temporary. It burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched, but you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. That's polycarp. That's perspective. That's purpose. And it didn't come from man. It came from God. And so he was burned at the stake, and then a spear was used to pierce his heart. He was unwilling to burn incense to the emperor of Rome. He didn't fear man because he wasn't willing to forget his God. It's not just his promises and his purposes, but it's his proclamations. It's what he has to say about you. Again, we live in a world that has a lot to say about you. And we use that to make so many terrible decisions. I'm going to go back to my high school days. I shared this with the high schoolers a couple weeks ago when I spoke at Breakaway. 
when I was in middle school, nerdy years, middle school ended, and I was like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like, come into a new life here, right? So cut the bowl cut, got a new wardrobe, um, went to a magnet school. Most of my friends were at other schools. I'm starting over, right? I was like, oh, man, this is going to be great. So I get there, and a group of girls in my school made fun of my hairy legs. My legs aren't even that hairy, all right? But they made fun of my hairy legs. Now, this is the early 2000s. This is in Southern California, all right? This is a moment of vulnerability, so don't judge me, okay? But one of the things that the popular people did, that the men on the football team and the basketball team did, is they shaved their legs. So what did I do for a full year? What did I do? I shaved my legs, all right? I learned the hard way that you do not jump into the ocean after you're right after you shave your legs. <laughs> Ladies know what I'm saying, all right? And again, I remind you that if you could go back to 14-year-old you, you would have some words. So don't, you, don't be quick to judge. But instead of the proclamation of man, we cling to the proclamation of God. Band, you can come up. We cling, claim and cling to him. And what does God have to say about you? Romans. For all who are led by the Spirit of God and sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Let me say that again. For all who are led by the Spirit of God as sons of God. This is not a sexist statement. It does not say sons and daughters. It's actually a good thing that it only says sons and not sons and daughters because women in that time when they were adopted were not brought in as heirs. What Paul is doing here is elevating women in society in a way they had not been before. He's saying to the women and the men, you're both now, from this cultural perspective, sons. That the inheritance is for everyone. That you are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery because that's what fear does. It is bondage. But you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. My wife and I, we compete with our son. Our son's now our 10-month-old over whether to say mama or dada first, right? And I feel dads get the, the short end of the stick because it's such a harder sound, duh, than m. all right? But in this particular case, if my kid spoke Aramaic, it would be so much easier because Abba was the Aramaic word for, that a small child would say as dada. Could you imagine a small child running to the door and saying, Abba, Abba, Abba? That's what it is. That we are no longer slaves, but we are adopted. And by we cry, Abba. We're no longer slaves, we're children of God. And any damage, any threat, any harm that's truly worth being fearful over was handled at the cross. You could be afraid of sin, Jesus handled it at the cross. You could be afraid of Satan, Jesus handled it at the cross. You could be afraid of death, Jesus handled it at the cross. So you can truly say, whom shall I fear? That Paul could write in the Philippians that to live is Christ, to die is gain. Whom shall I fear? What's left to fear? There's a lot of things in this world competing for your hope, competing for your trust, competing for your confidence, and inevitably they will overpromise and underdeliver. Jesus never does. He is the one whom we cling to. He is the one in whom we put our confidence. He is the one who broadens our perspective. He is the one who we remember when things are hard. It is him in whom we put our faith. Martin Luther King, there's a quote in his grandma's wall that he never forgot. And it, and it said, fear not, faith answered. There was no one there. Fear not, faith answered. No one was there. If you forget God, you will fear man. What if we started fearing God and forgetting man instead. Fear not. Faith answered. No one was there. We are not a slave to sin. We are children of God. Let's sing.